let's talk Hebrew prepositions. In this video, we're going to cover three different kinds of prepositions. Independent, maketh, and inseparable. So independent prepositions in Hebrew are exactly like English prepositions. They stand alone. They're not dependent on another noun uh, or another word, I should say. They occur before the noun, just like in English. So here's an example. Lifne hamelik, before the king. Now the object of the preposition is the noun that follows the preposition. So in this example, lifne is the preposition, hamelik is the object of the preposition. Let's look at another example. Pachath haetz, under the tree. And another example, achar hamabul, after the flood. These are very simple. The preposition comes first, followed by the object of the preposition, which is the noun. We have makef prepositions. In a way, they're kind of like English with hyphenated words. Not the same thing, but you get the idea. Now, the makef is not a hyphen. It is a horizontal line, but it's raised from the middle up to the top of most of the consonants. Of course, not above the lamed, because the lamed is the king. So, it is a dependent preposition in that it is tied to the noun by the makef. It's got this conjoined style of words. Let's look at some examples. Al ha'evin, upon the stone. El ha'heichal, to the temple. Ad hanahar, as far as the river. Min ha'aretz, from the land. So these are examples of the Maketh prepositions. And you can see it's got this horizontal line that joins the preposition to the noun, to the uh, object of the preposition. And then there is this massive category of inseparable prepositions. These are dependent, just like the Maketh prepositions but there's no makef. Instead, the preposition becomes a prefix on the noun. It occurs almost 39,000 times. It's a lot, a lot, but it's simple. There's only three of them. There's be, so it's the bet with a dagesh, okay? There's the vocal shiva. It means in, by, or with. There's le. It's the lamed plus vocal shiva. It means two, four, something like that. And then there's k. And it has the dagesh lene plus a vocal shiva. It means like, as, according to. Now, there's a lot more uh, meanings behind each of these prepositions. I gave you just the ones that are text covered. There's a lot more. Your lexicon is your friend. It will help you see much more nuance for these prepositions. So just keep that in mind. It's not just simply b in by with. No, there's a lot more to it than that. It's a prefix. So it adds to the front of a word. Let me show you an example. Bisave, in a field. It's a vocal shiva underneath the bit, and the, the noun to which it's attached is really undisturbed. Okay, bisave, in a field. Linaar, same thing. Got the vocal shiva up front, and then the noun to which it's attached, really undisturbed. Okay, it means for a young man or something like that. Look at Kamelic, uh, like a king, 
or as a king. Again, you have the k, you have the cough, and then and then the vocal shava, and then the noun melik, totally undisturbed. Now sometimes when the preposition is joining with a noun that begins with a reduced vowel, a hatef vowel, it the preposition will change the vocal shava to the vowel in the hatef. It follows the same rule that we saw with the voc with the uh, with the with the vav conjunction. So, look at the example of ka'anashim. Ka'anashim, the noun is using a hatef pathak. So the preposition ka is taking a pathak instead of a vocal shava. It means like men. Look at be'emet, in truth. The bait would normally have a vocal shava, but because the noun begins with a hatef segel, it takes a segel. Look at uh, lachalai, It means for sickness. The lamed would normally take a vocal shava, but because the Chet takes a hatef kametz, the lamed takes a kametz. So just be aware that when you are dealing with prepositions, it's not always going to have a vocal shava. Sometimes it can take a different vowel. It depends on what's coming next. Look at uh, lin vi'im. So in this case, normally the lamed would take a vocal shava, but because uh, Navim here is also starting with a vocal shava, you can't have two vocal shavas together in Hebrew. So what happens is the first vocal shava lengthens to become hirik, and the second vocal shava ends up becoming a silent shava in a closed syllable. So instead of le n Vim, it's lin vim. Closed. And it's silent. And that means four prophets or two prophets, something along those lines. Look at livrith. Okay? It's the same thing. We can't have two vocal shavas. The first vocal shava becomes a hiric, and the second one becomes a silent shava. Livrith for a covenant. Now, what do you do when you also have the definite article with the preposition? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. Look at sade, a field, or simply field. If you add a preposition, the preposition will take the place of the hey in the definite article. Remember, the definite article is hey, pathak, and a dagesh forte. Okay? Those are the three markers of your definite article. So the preposition will take the place of the hey and keep the pathak and keep the dagesh forte. So sade becomes basade. Basade. Okay, in the field. You still have the pathak, you still have the dagesh, but the bet has taken the place of the hay. It's simple. You know that normally the, the bet would take a vocal shava, but now you see, oh wait, there's the pathak here. Ah, something's different. There must be a definite article here. Okay, so in the field, basade. Look at esh, fire. Ba esh. In the fire. This one's a little different. The aleph is a guttural. It doesn't take a dagesh. So then what happens is there's compensatory lengthening. So the pathak becomes a comets. 
ha ish instead of a pathak ha ish now i'm kind of finagling the pronunciation a little bit for one i'm not good at pronunciation two i'm trying to show the difference between the pathak and the comments i would not normally pronounce it ba ish if it were a, a pathak i would still pronounce it ba ba ish but uh i'm not really good at pronunciation so whatever in the fire ba ish or uh lana r to the boy or to the young man lana r kamelik like the king kamelik instead of melik ka melik that's the difference so remember when adding the definite article the hey drops in place of the preposition but the pathak is retained in place of the vocal shaba. Now let's talk about the preposition mean. It's an interesting preposition. It can take either a maketh or it could simply be inseparable. Now, when it's inseparable, the noon will assimilate, it will drop. And in its place, the next consonant will take a dagesh forte. For example, in with melik, if you have an inseparable min plus melik, it becomes mamelik. The noon drops out. The first consonant of the noun takes a dogish forte, which doubles the mem. And we still have the hierarch at the front under the initial mem from mean. So it becomes mamelik from a king. Now, there are some interesting rules here because some letters, namely the Bagad Kafats, will take their Dagesh Lene and change it to a Dagesh Forte when the uh, mean is inseparably attached. The uh, gutturals. So nouns that begin with a guttural, when you attach mean, the guttural can't take a dagesh, so it drops. Instead, what happens is the hierarch lengthens to a tsere under the mim, under the mem. And if the guttural is a het, sometimes, but not always, there is neither a dagesh nor compensatory lengthening. That's kind of an interesting observation. If the definite article is included, in this case, the hey is retained. It doesn't drop like we saw with uh, b, k, or l. So let me show you an example of a makef with, with mean. It's very straightforward. Mean ham, hamal ka from the queen. Very straightforward. You can see the mean preposition plus the makef plus the noun with the definite article and everything. It's easy. We already talked about mamelik from a king. Uh, here's an example with a bagad kafat, mabayat, mabayat. So the the noon drops out entirely. The dagesh lene becomes dagesh forte, and we still have the mean plus here at the front. So from a house. Uh, with a Aleph guttural, Me'ish, there is no Dagesh. This means from a man. There's no Dagesh. But the Hirik has compensatory lengthened to a Tsere under, under the Mem. And then we have uh, Mechutz. Mechutz, from outside. It's a Chet, so it's a guttural. But uh there's no dagesh and there's no compensatory lengthening it doesn't always work out this way with a chet guttural but that's what happened here the last example i have is uh me haaretz from the land and this shows that um when the definite article is included the hay does not drop out now what we have instead is um, there's no dogish, 
because it's a guttural even though the, the noon has dropped and we have compensatory lengthening we have a tsere under the meme mem instead of a here uh that that helps us figure out okay so we've got mean plus hey plus our noun audits from the land now when it comes to using mean there are a couple of instances where it's not going to simply just mean from the context will be key so let me start by talking about english first let's say we have the adjective big well there's a comparative use of big and it becomes bigger there's a superlative use it becomes biggest that's the sort of thing we're talking about when we're talking about mean and how it's used there's a comparative use there's a superlative use and there is also a partitive use okay comparative uh, would be bigger than, better than, something along those lines. It's comparing one thing to the other. There's a superlative use, meaning things like best, most, greatest, something along those lines. And then there's the partitive use. This would mean like it's a part of, of a whole. It's, it's a portion of something. So you would probably translate it along the lines of sum of. So let's take a look at some examples on how to use mean or how it is used rather. Starting with tova chakma mizahav. Tova chakma mizahav. It would be best translated, wisdom is better than gold. Literally, it means wisdom is good from gold that doesn't make sense no it's comparing wisdom is better than gold uh, so in this case you have the word wisdom it's the second word chokma. you have the adjective tova which is the first word and then you have what it's comparing to Zahav, gold. So better than gold. Look at the next example. Tov Hasafer Haze Min Hasafer Hahu. So it's if you were to translate this word for word in the order it's in, it would be literally good the scroll this. From the scroll that that makes no sense so finagle it a little bit uh we can re reorder some of the words so this scroll is good from that scroll that still doesn't make sense no we need to use the helping words better than this scroll is better than that scroll that's a comparative use. Now there's another comparative use and it uses different helping words. Um, so look at our example, kasha ha avatha meha anashim. The work is too difficult for the men. Comparative use. So kasha, to be difficult. It's the verb. It's the first word. Ha, ha avatha, the work. Me, meha anashim, from the men. So if you were to translate this literally, uh, the work is difficult from the men. That doesn't make sense. No, the work is too difficult for the men. This is another uh, uh, comparative use. So when you see mean, it's not always going to be from. It can function comparatively when it's comparing two things or, or marking some sort of degree it could be comparing. It could also be a superlative. Now, when you see the superlative, it's easy to tell because you'll see mean plus kol. Kol means all. So mikol means from every or from all. It marks the superlative use. Look at our example. 
Arum Mikol Hayat Hasade. Hasade. You would translate this literally as uh, clever from every living thing, the field. Great. What do I, what is, what? Huh? No, you have to add some extra stuff here. The most clever living thing of the field. Okay. So the superlative use adds that best, better. No, it's best. There's nothing better. It is superlative. So it's the most clever living thing of the field. Okay. How do you know it's superlative? Because of McCall. You see McCall, you see superlative. Okay. The partitive, meaning part of a whole, um, you, you got to check the context. You have to check the context in all of these, but uh, that would be your clue based on context that you're going to translate this as sum of a whole. So, mepri, sum of the fruit. Meha anashim, sum of the men. So context is key in all of these circumstances, uh, but especially with the part of it. Let's talk about the de definite direct object marker. You have uh, your subject and then you have your predicate. The predicate includes the verb and the direct object. The direct object is what receives the action of the verb. Now in Hebrew, sometimes in Hebrew prose, you will have the definite direct object marker. The definite direct object marker. It marks the direct object in the predicate. It is also uh, referred to as the accusative marker. Okay. It must attach to a definite noun. So if the noun is not definite, you cannot have the definite direct object marker. Now it looks identical to the preposition eth, which means with. So again, context is key. Context will help you determine, is this the preposition or is this the definite direct object marker? Now if you determine it's the definite direct object marker, it's not even translated. It's just there to, to help you understand syntactically what you're dealing with. You don't translate it. If it's the preposition, you do translate it. Okay. Keep in mind a couple things and you'll, you'll understand what this means more later when we cover it. But the, the noun in the direct object marker, nouns that have pronominal suffixes can take the direct object marker. Pronominal suffixes is the opposite of the prefix. So it goes at the end of the word. And in Hebrew, you can say things like his king, your king. Well, it would just add a suffix to the word king for you or his or my. We'll get into that in a few more chapters. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But the thing to keep in mind when it comes to the definite direct object marker is it can attach to nouns that may not even have the uh, definite article, but it has a pronominal suffix and that makes it definite by nature. Okay. Uh, it's not just any king. No, it's your king or it's my king or it's his king. That's definite by nature. So when that happens, it, it can take the definite direct object marker. So the important thing to remember is context is key. The definite direct object marker must attach to a definite noun. That definite noun can be a noun that has a pronominal suffix or the definite article, or it could be a proper noun. A proper noun is by definition definite, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, that's definite. 
That's not an Abraham. Mm -mm. No, that's that is Abraham. Okay, so it's definite by nature. Now, when it's not the definite direct object marker, it is the preposition with. With. Okay, so those are the things to remember. So I've got several examples here for you. Kathav F. Hadvarim Basafer. He wrote the words in the book. So the words Hadvarim is the uh, direct object of the sentence. Bara Elohim et Hashamayim. God created the heavens. So the heavens, Hashamayim, is the direct object of the sentence. You can tell because it's marked by et. Nathan Hanavi et Hasafer Lamelech. The prophet gave the book to the king. Hasafer is the direct object. Bana Hamelech et Hahechal Hagdol. The king built the great temple. Great is an adjective. It is not the direct object. Hachechal is the direct object. It's the temple. The temple is the object. You just got to throw great in the middle because that's how English works, but not so in Hebrew. Now, what you'll notice, I want to add this comment, not to put the cart before the horse, but you see a trend in patterns between all of these examples where you have the verb first, the subject second, and the object third. I call it VSO, verb, subject, object. And that's your standard Hebrew word order. You know, in English, we typically have subject, verb, object. Hebrew changes that. Verb, subject, object. Now, it doesn't always abide by that. But for the most part, it does. Okay, so that's kind of the general rule. Verb, subject, object. We'll wrap up now with uh, a short conversation around compound prepositions. There's three uh, different ones to be aware of. It'll take some memorization on your part, uh, but be able to recognize them especially. There's prepositions plus panim. Panim means faces. It's plural. There are prepositions plus mean. We've seen that already. In fact, we've also seen prepositions plus panim and there are some prepositions that have been attached to nouns and they've become their own word as a whole so you'll need to be aware of those as well let's talk about the panim prepositions again it means faces plural there are numerous combinations that you can have you'll want to memorize at least these four that i'm going to cover for you here we've seen this one already lifne it literally means two faces not the number two, but the preposition two faces. Uh, and so you translate it as before or in the presence of. Mipne, mipne, literally from faces. Min plus panim. You would translate it away from, out from, from the presence of, from before, on account of, because of, something along those lines. The same is true of milfne, milfne, away from, from before, from the presence of, on account of. It literally means from two faces, mean plus le plus parim. And then we have al pene, in the face of, in the side of, in front of, before, up, uh, up against rather, opposite to. It literally means upon faces. All panim. So those are our prepositions plus panim. We also have prepositions plus mean. So me all, mean plus all, from upon. Pretty straightforward. Mid tacha, from under, mean plus tacha. Meef, from with. Mean plus F. And then we have some prepositions that have combined with nouns. And in that combination, they've just become 
understood as one preposition. So all davar, literally meaning upon word, all plus the noun davar, you would translate this collectively as one preposition, on account of. Bethok, bethok, in the midst of. It's literally in middle. Be havet, in the midst of. Matok, or matok, from the midst of. Literally, from middle. Min havet. Well, that's our discussion today of Hebrew prepositions. Fairly straightforward stuff. I hope you found it useful. Now go practice learning your vocabulary and get ready for next week. Next week, we'll get into adjectives and add a whole lot more color to the language. See what I did there? Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to follow my blog, yakobu.wordpress.com. Uh, if you want to support me, hey, you've got some options. You could buy one of my commentaries. You can uh, subscribe to my monthly newsletter on my blog. You can tip me. You can buy swag, whatever. There's options. But I'm just glad you're watching this video and joining me on this journey down Hebrew. I hope you're enjoying it. I will see you next week. Take care.